on K Talk. Welcome to the Jim Kirkwood Show. As you can tell, I'm not Jim. I'm Steve Reinhardt, substituting for Jim tonight. And this is the place where Utah's history, politics, culture, and religion collide. I'm happy to be with you tonight on Utah's oldest continually broadcasting radio station, K Talk. AM 630, rounding out the evening programming tonight, telling you everything you never knew you wanted to know. Here at Liberty Park in Salt Lake and around the country, hundreds of thousands of immigrants are demonstrating for their rights. Today they're boycotting American businesses. They're not going to work. They're trying to show how much they matter to the American economy, as I'm sure most of you have seen on the news. It's a huge issue. We are pleased tonight to have on for a few minutes Congressman Bishop, who will be helping us introduce tonight's topic. We'll be getting his perspective. He's one of Utah's three congressmen. We'll get a fourth after the 2010 census. I met him at the Salt Lake County Republican Convention on Saturday. And he's taking some time from his family and his busy schedule to be with us. It's a privilege. We're going to ask him about the Sensenbrenner Bill, the 14th Amendment, and even about Mitt Romney. We'll go to him in a second, but first a quick word on current events. We're going to be having on the Attorney General, Mark Shirtliff, in studio with us on Wednesday. I'll be substituting again Wednesday night, 9 o'clock. We're going to be talking to him about his recent speech at another immigration rally a couple of weeks back and his position on some issues of constitutional law and state law, like the 14th Amendment and Utah House Bill 144, which passed in the Utah legislature in 2002. Many people think it's unconstitutional. Mark spoke at the Salt Lake County Convention Saturday. He introduced Laura Miller, who's running for a district attorney in Salt Lake County, and she got the nomination there in convention, I think mainly because of Mark Shirley's introduction. She was running against a seasoned prosecutor of 20 years, and she, as far as I know, she's never prosecuted any felonies to speak of. Her and her husband are contracted by cities whose prosecution misdemeanor schedules get full to do prosecutions, and hopefully she does a good job as DA. I, hope, I think she's got a chance of getting it. We'll talk about that later. We're going to be talking about 300 new laws that passed the Utah legislative session this last time around and a House bill that Democrats in the U.S. Congress may pass if they can retake the U.S. Senate and U.S. House, something else we're going to talk to Congressman Bishop about in just a minute. We'll go to that a little later on. First, let's go to Congressman Bishop. Congressman, we appreciate you being with us on the air today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for the offer to be here. I know you're a busy guy. These demonstrations are going on all around the country. The Sensenbrenner bill has passed. There's people uh, wanting the issue to be dealt with in different ways. Can you tell us, really, how do you feel about immigration? How do you think the best way is for this problem to be solved? Well, it is... It sounds almost like a cop-out to say it's complex, but it is complex because it's been developing to the position we're in for the last 40 years. Um, so it's not going to be solved with a simple, easy solution. You don't snap your fingers and reverse what's happened over 40 years. However, having said that, to me, the first thing I would do is simply make sure that we can control the borders. Uh, I mean, if, if you want to prevent illegal immigration, you don't have to deal with Ill illegal immigration. If you can stop the inflow of illegal immigrants, then you can address the rest of the problem in a very calm and easy manner. But th if we fail to secure the borders, um, then no other reform measure we do is ever going to be effective. Do you think the Sensenbrenner bill goes too far or not far enough? It aims to put a 750-mile wall along the border. No, to me, that one, that part of it is not good. There are a couple of parts that I, that I uh, didn't like. In fact, I voted against a couple of them. But the bill we, can, we voted for to keep the issue alive, because the Senate has to come up with something, and they're playing around with three different versions right now, and then it goes to a conference committee. Why is the Senate weaker on immigration and border security than the House? Uh, um, I, I think it goes back, and I, this is more of an answer than you want. I apologize. No, no. The House of Representatives is basically a majoritarian body that, that what the majority gets can pass. Because of the rules of the Senate, it is really a minority body. And so to get anything done, you have to have at least 60 votes, or it can be filibustered or it can be held. And therefore, the minority has an unusual amount of sway. Uh, I, I, you know, if we're the minority, I guess that's good. Right now, I don't think it's that positive. So it's always going to have a more difficult time. Unless the filibuster rule gets thrown out. Do you think it ought to be thrown out? I think it should be modified. I mean, it, there's, there's nothing constitutional about it. It's simply a pattern that has developed. The House used to have a filibuster rule in the negative uh, in, in called a disappearing majority that we, that we prohibited by a rule 
back when uh, Thomas Bracken Reed was the speaker in the 18, 1890s. The Senate could do the same thing. Do you think the 14th Amendment can be changed by legislation? Can it be statutorily modified? Is it something that's causing us huge amounts of problems? How do you feel about that, Congressman? Well, <laughs> you're going to get me in trouble here. <laughs> that's what we like to do on the yeah, station. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> to me, the 14th Amendment um, has been misinterpreted historically, and it goes back to the 1920s and the Gitlo case, when in almost a throwaway line, they said that the 14th Amendment obviously applies all the provisions of the Constitution to states and local government. Uh, and even though it was said then, it wasn't really practiced that way by the courts until like the 1950s. So to me, the 14th Amendment is not necessarily what they intended, and it has had, the, had a negative impact of making a Constitution that was supposed to be designed to limit the federal government also apply to state and local governments at the same time. So if you're asking me about the 14th Amendment, I think we're misinterpreting it all along, not only in this issue, but in every other issue that's there. Is this something that has to go through the court system? Is this something that we need some sort of judgment from the Supreme Court about? Well, it could be either way, to be honest with you. It could be done by a declaratory judgment. Um, that bothers me because um, some of the reasons why it is mandatory to provide health care services on the border areas right now are because the courts mandated that as they have I said misinterpreted, I think, the 14th Amendment. Um, I would rather have, in any sense, the legislative direction go through it and do it by statute, because if you use the legislative body, um, you know that there's going to be input, you know there's going to be debate, but actually the majority will, will ultimately rule, will out as long as you can keep the Senate in check. If you go through the courts, by definition, that's going to be a minority decision. One person will do it, or a group of people will do it, and it may not necessarily be satisfying the American electorate. What do you think is going to happen with this issue? Where do you think the Senate's going to go with it? Do you think it's going to get resolved in the near future? Or is this something that's going to take an indefinite amount of time to, to figure out? Well, it worries me only because, you know, there's an old adage back there in Congress that there's two things we do well, nothing and overreacting. And in this situation, I, I am very nervous about the overreacting. I, I'm serious that I would like to take it in lock steps. I think we need totally reform the system we have so it is easier for people to legally immigrate. Um, the, the 11 million or how many there are um, need to have a way of becoming citizens, but not through a shortcut. Uh, so all these, and we have so many forms and visas and, and paperwork that we, we exacerbate the problem because of our failure to actually handle that well. But to me, all of that seems almost meaningless if you can't really secure the border. And... Um, we're in a different world. You know, back when I was growing up, we were very proud that we had unsecured borders because the enemy coming in would be an army. You could tell who they are. Now the enemy coming in is somebody carrying a suitcase, and it could be and, – and, and that's the other thing I hope we emphasize all the time. This is not just about uh, Mexico or Hispanics. We're talking about people who are from the Middle East, Europe, Africa, Vietnamese, Chinese, Canadians. This is a national security issue. But let me throw the phone numbers out really quickly. Salt Lake 254-5855, Provo 470-5855, Ogden 670-5855. We're talking to Congressman Bishop about the immigration issues, about the demonstrations going on around the country today. Congressman, Article 4 of the Constitution says that it's up to the federal government to protect the states from invading armies. Do you think that illegal immigration constitutes an invading army? Zell Miller, Republican senators have said that it, what's going on with the immigration issue amounts to a bipartisan dereliction of duty. Would you agree with that statement? Do you think the problem is that serious? Um, well, yes, to be honest with you, but it's a 40-year dereliction of duty. It's not something that is unique right now. And like I say, uh, you don't... It, it's one of my religious leaders once used the analogy that if the plane is going in another direction, you have to apply steady and consistent pressure to slowly turn it around can't make a 90-degree turn. And so it's, it's going to take a while to turn those things around. And once again, I would, I would like us to take them in steps. And, and once again, I, I go back to if, if all we did in this session this year is simply put in place the, the processes to secure the border, to increase the number of, of personnel who are down there, to put some physical, some motion-sensitive border lines in there, to secure the border both in the south and the north, I would feel good, and then give us some time to look at how we deal with the expatriation or the rest of, of the program. 
our lines are full with callers who've got questions for you. We'd like to take a couple of them in just a minute. We know that uh, you don't have a lot of time tonight. A couple of quick questions. Utah has been accused of being very lenient on immigration laws. Now, you obviously are a member of the U.S. Congress, but do you feel that here in Utah, CNN has recently said it were the third, the, the state that's, that's giving, having the third biggest influx of immigrants in the country, do you think we're too weak on immigration laws? We have in-state tuition for immigrants. We have driver privilege cards for them. The list goes on and on. Is it something that needs to be worked on at the state level and the federal level? How do you feel about that? Well, I'm, I'm not going to tell the state legislature or the governor what they ought to do. That's, that is clearly their purview. And what we have tried to do, for example, we passed the Real ID Act, which said states could do what they want to with driver's licenses. But if you're going to use them for federal ID purposes, they have to guarantee that it is a legal citizen who holds that, that card. So I, I think there's the state can do what it wants to do. I think what, the federal government has enough problems without trying to tell the state of Utah how to handle its laws. Let's take a couple of callers quickly. We've got questions for you. We want to talk to you before you get off the line about Mitt Romney and just get a two-minute feeling from you about him. But first, let's go to Mike on our Salt Lake County line. Excuse me. Well, let's try that again. Mike, you're on the program with Congressman Bishop. Yeah, I just wanted to congratulate your Congressman. Uh, this was all done under a Republican administration. Uh, the United States is now balkanized, and we've got a fifth column in here. And, uh, you know, this is exactly what the globalists wanted. In fact, they explained that uh, the, what, what they would create is three separate unions throughout the world in order to create a global government. Well, now we have the Pan-American one getting started, and it was all done under the Bush administration, under the Republicans. Congressman, you and I will stand before God one day, and, and I hope you can justify the DREAM Act, and I hope you can justify what these, uh, these people have done in our Mike, we really appreciate it. You sound really excited. We uh, we want to keep this on the issues and not try to get religion mixed up in it. Go, how do you respond to that, Congressman? Do you, are, is there a general sense of outrage here among uh, many, many members of uh, your constituency? Do you do you get criticisms like that very often? Well, yeah, and and to be honest, there's an outrage I think amongst uh, the uh, the legal immigrant community as well. And. Uh, what, what we, we really have to realize is that, you know, that there's the concept of, of, of legal is a significant word here, and that laws are laws, and they should not be handled simply as a suggestion. Formerly, illegal immigrants had to sign documentation promising not to avail themselves of social services. Hopefully we can get this problem solved. We've got Greg on line five. Greg, you're on the air with Congressman Bishop. Congressman Bishop, it is time for Congress to grow a backbone and some other male appendages and crack down on all these illegal immigrants, and we're tired of the mealy mouth position that all of you take on this issue. All right. How do you respond to that, Congressman? Uh, <laughs> once again, we have another outraged caller. There's Hopefully we have a few, other, few on other here than, that are nice. Other than, once again, the first thing we do is control the border. If, if we haven't controlled the it makes no sense of rounding everyone up and sending them back now if they're just going to come back again. So to me, take the first step, which is controlling the border. But you don't support a fence. You don't think that's the answer. No, I, a fence would be fine. We, it doesn't even have to be you know, a physical fence. I, I went to Israel and saw how they have, have done around the Gaza Strip, which is done with a very cheap, highly sophisticated, technological, uh, emotion-sensitive devices. I mean, we, there are lots of ways of doing this, but a, a physical barrier is just fine. One of the things we did do, you know, there, there is a fence down by San Diego to have that 15-mile hole in it because con the environmentalists said there was an endangered shrub. And part of the bill that we passed was simply saying, you know, to, to hell with the shrub, we're going to build the wall. So we, there has to be some control of the border, and if it's a physical barrier, fine. Congressman King, one of your colleagues who's really big on immigration reform, said today that he wants to introduce a bill, or he's introducing a bill, that will rescind the tax deduction that employers can take on pay that they give immigrants. Would you support a bill like that? Do you think it would be effective? I'd support it. Whether it would be effective or not, I don't know. I, I assume so on the surface, but yeah, I'd support it. In 1986, amnesty was given to about 3 million a here. We now maybe, by some estimates, have 10 times that much. If we're not careful about the guest worker program, is this just going to blow out of control, in your opinion, in the future, or is this going to become an issue that's impossible to deal with if we don't deal with it now? Yeah, it, exactly, and that's why I want to make sure that we do it, we do it the right way. 
Um, I have no problem with helping people become citizens, but there cannot be a shortcut to that citizenship and getting people on it. And that's what exactly what amnesty is. It, it lets people do the shortcut. And, uh, and people have to be held accountable for their actions. And there has to be a program that holds people accountable. And the illegal aliens have to be accountable for that. Those who are illegal who commit a crime, that's like two illegal actions too many. And, you know, but once again, unless if we have a porous border, uh, trying to deal with that problem doesn't do any good until we get control of the border. Jeff, you're on the air with Congressman Bishop. Uh, hello. Yes, Mr. you're Jeff? on the air. Hi, Congressman. Um, thanks for being on the air. It's been, been good listening. I had a question. I, you know, back when uh, the primary mode of travel was, was by boat, uh, we had Ellis Island. Would something like a checkpoint uh, along the border, several locations, maybe at each state, um, could something like that be be implemented? I was thinking, you know, people that had papers that were were, were that could show that they had uh, either a visa or citizenship could could cross, and those who don't would have the opportunity to start the process of citizenship if they wanted to pursue that. And then you also have the opportunity to check medical uh, uh, health and that sort of thing too. I, to me, I think that sounds logical and would work. Once again, part of the problem in getting legal people into this country has simply been the paperwork trail, the number of types of visas we have, which is something like 27, 28, it's ridiculous, that's many, and the time it takes for the American uh, Immigration Service to process papers of legal immigrants. Um, mm -hmm. So that has to be streamlined as well, and that's part of the problem. But obviously, if you're going to have some kind of border security, you have to have checkpoints got to be several different ones along both the southern and northern border to do that. Mm -hmm. is, is, Congressman, is the Immigration Service and the Border Patrol, are they incompetent? Are they doing their job well? I don't, I don't know. I, I, they may just be overwhelmed. I don't know. Hey, we appreciate the call, Jeff. Let's go to Laura on our Sully County line. Laura, you're on the air with Congressman Bishop. Yes, sir. I, I was wondering, and maybe I'm just up in my sleep, but, you know, I thought, if we cut off all of the incentives, like the medical and the free school and things like that, to the illegals, it seems like that would stop them flowing over the borders, too. I mean, they are getting benefits in many, many ways, and it just seems like stop that, you know? Couldn't, can't that be done? That would deal with part of the problem. There are some people who are coming over the borders simply to get the benefits. Mm -hmm. There are people who are coming over the border to commit crimes and are part of the crime network. Those are the kinds of people we want to make sure that we are able to round up and get back and make sure they don't come over again. Right. Um, there are some, though, that don't quite fit into that category, and that's another element you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Hey, we appreciate the call. We've got uh, several people. Let's just take one or two more, and then, and then we'll move on to something else here. Walter, Salt Lake City Line, you're on the air with Congressman Bishop. Uh, yes, um, I'd like to make a couple of points. Go ahead. One thing is, you know, when the the illegal aliens and they talk about Hispanics, you know, basically it's it's a racial racial issue basically because you don't hear nothing about the illegal European, you know, white people coming in illegally. Well, the white European people did not come in illegally, Walter. A lot of them do come in, and a lot of them don't want to learn English. I mean, you know, people are picking on the Hispanics. It's a basically a racial issue, and the good old boys from Utah don't want to acknowledge that. I mean, the more they come in, the better. The more Spanish people speak up for themselves, the better. Did, did you have a, a question for uh, Congressman Bishop, or did you just want to make that comment? Well, um, I'd like to know what, you know, if him and Mr. Cannon are working, you know, because Chris Cannon does have some uh, reasonable ideas, and Chris Cannon does seem to be, you know, being more reasonable, even though he is a Republican. Okay, we appreciate those comments, Walter. What do you I, what do you think, Congressman Bishop? About I, that? I didn't hear except the very end. And I think he was he talking about this illegal. I, I hope what he was saying is that this is not just simply an anti-Hispanic issue. What we're talking about is controlling the border and securing the entries into this country from all of those who would be who would pose a problem of national security, and that includes whether they're from Russia or from Africa or the Middle East. This is not just an anti. Uh, Hispanic control and stop Hispanics from coming into this country. What we're talking about is we have, in a, this new era of terrorism, we have got to be able to make sure that we can control those who would harm this country regardless from where they come. 
So this is not a racial issue at all. I hope we don't ever turn it in to either a racial or an economic issue. It's a national security issue about all of those who would do harm to this country. I hope that once again we can all keep the rhetoric in line and make sure that we don't make it a racial issue. It's not. It's about security. Let's just take one final call here. Jeannie, you're on the air with Congressman Bishop. Uh, hi. Um, I'm like most of the callers that you've had. I'm really outraged about what's going on. And I feel like it's you, you politicians, it's a slap in the face to every immigrant that's come here legally that's learned our language and that wants to be an American. Because these illegals have no allegiance to America. They, they, they tell us that they're taking back this land. I mean, they're going to take over. You, why shouldn't they have to learn Spanish? I mean, uh, English. Why should everything in America be done in Spanish now? You know, Congressman, we've had people singing the national anthem in Spanish recently. How do you feel about that comment? I, 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 I feel there's a lot of validity to the comment that the, the caller just came in with. Um, Newt Gingrich had a great line in which he said, all Americans should learn two languages, one of which has to be English. Um, I, I don't, to me, um, that is some, one of the things that will naturally happen. If anyone comes into this country, regardless, once again, from where they are, whether it's from Europe or Africa or, or Latin America, if they are going to succeed, they will have to function in English. And, um, I mean, that's one of the givens. I, I always like to point out, just try and put things in context, you know, that my father-in-law was born in this country. He was born in the state of Utah. And he had to wait a year to go into school because even though he lived his entire life in Utah, he didn't speak English. And this was the 1920s. He spoke Danish. Mm -hmm. So I'm, it, to function in this society has to be English. And, and that's one of the reasons why when I was in the state legislature, I always co-sponsored uh, English as official language. I don't have any problem with other languages there as long as the official language is English because that is the fact that will bind us together and unify us. We, we, all we have to do is look at Canada and realize that a bilingual policy does not work and it does not unify. According to Deseret News, 85% of Utahns support immigration reform. I can't believe the state legislature gives in-state tuition to illegal immigrants. Before we let you go, quickly... Well, I, sure. Let me just say two things. Um, first of all, there is a federal law that that violates. I mean, the state it's, is in violation of it, that. It, it is in violation of 8 U.S.C. 1623, which... Yeah. And and we, we have some questions for the Attorney General when he's here on Wednesday night about why the AG's office has told the legislature that that law is not preempted by federal statute. What? It ought to be. Let me just say one other thing. I mean, that Congress is dealing with this issue right now. The House has already passed a bill, which um, which probably will be considerably tougher than what the Senate will come up with, because once again, the Senate is a minority-driven body, not a majority-driven body. And then there will be a conference. Uh, my only fear as we go through this is that, that we can do more harm if we're not careful, that we do it the right way. And, yeah, Congress has to act, but we have to act the right way. Before we let you go, quickly tell us a little bit about uh, Washington. How are people feeling about Mitt Romney? Can we look forward to having a Mormon president soon? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure people on the Hill are talking about it. Uh, you know, I to be honest, I have, I have no idea. I have, Romney has been there a couple of times. Um, he looks good. He sounds good. Uh, I think he'd be a very good and viable candidate. But there's a whole lot of good viable candidates out there. It, it's going to see what, what happens. I, I think what will happen in both parties, at least right now, well, first of all, there's so much time. I mean, this is wild speculation. But we probably have McCain as a forerunner with Republicans, and the Democrats have Hillary Clinton. What I think will probably emerge is there will be a McCain and a non-McCain candidate that will come out. And the same thing with the Democrats. They'll have a Clinton and a non-Hillary Clinton candidate. And so we'll see who actually survives. So Republicans are considering McCain, Bill Frist, George Allen, Rudolph Giuliani. I don't think any of them are... You, so you believe McCain has a chance? I don't think Republicans like him. Do Republicans like him on the Hill? I haven't. I'm not going to say that in public, but I haven't. <laughs> I, I haven't. I haven't uh, signed on or endorsed any candidate. I'm still looking. There's there's a lot of people that are out there. We could probably list about a half dozen names of people who I think would be good, strong conservatives. But I don't know if they're going to be running, if they're going to be viable, and uh, it's a long way till the next election. And I really don't know. I I couldn't give a crystal ball of what will happen, what won't happen. 
Well, we really appreciate you coming on the air tonight. We wish that we had more time to talk with you. We'd love to have some other time. It's been a privilege, uh, Congressman. Do you have any final thoughts on uh, current events or immigration? No, it, it is. It is, a signif- it is not just a, a significant issue right now since the, the, the uh, marches have taken place. Um, when I, since I was first elected, I've been having town hall meetings every time we've had a break. It has always been an issue. Uh, probably the one issue that has run through every town hall meeting, we've talked about immigration at some time. And once again, we have to change the mindset we have, reverse about 40 years of inaction and, and poor policy and a lot of judicial decisions. But still, for me, the first thing I want to do is make sure that we have the borders controlled because then reform on the rest of it will make, will make sense. Otherwise, if it's just a revolving door on both the northern and southern border, it's pretty useless. Well, keep doing a good job up there for us. Thank you for the opportunity of coming in. Maybe we can do this again sometime. Thank you, Congressman Bishop, very much. Okay. That's been Congressman Bishop from the U.S. 2nd Congressional District. We appreciate him coming on the air. I'm Steve Reinhardt, substituting for Jim Kirkwood tonight. We've been talking about immigration. We apologize we weren't able to get to the rest of the calls, but if you have comments on the interview you just heard or how our Utah senators, Bob Bennett, Orrin Hatch, Ron Bishop, Chris Cannon, or Jim Matheson are handling the immigration issue, or the state government in general, give us a call. So like 254-5855, Provo 470-5855, Ogden 670-5855.